The controller told us that these objects uh, had been observed for over two weeks, coming down from over 80,000 feet, rapidly descending to 20,000 feet, hanging out for hours, and then going straight back up. For those who don't realize, above 80,000 feet in space. Is there a correlation between any of the characteristics of these UAPs, UFOs? What we tend to see are the smaller vehicles tend to be, uh, think of a sports car. The large ones tend to be uh, not always, but almost exclusively either triangular shape or boomerang shape. community was fairly surprised. Shocked might be a better word. If you believe we have crashed craft, uh, stated earlier, do we have the bodies of the pilots who piloted this craft? Biologics came with some of these recoveries. Yeah. Were they, I guess, human or non-human biologics? Non-human. Do you think there is life on other planets? Well, I'm not quite sure, but I suppose there would be. I seen a flying saucer. You seen one? Yes, when definitely. At Lane Cove. When? When was it? 1953. You don't think this is a figment of your imagination? Ooh, several other people with me saw it. Whistleblower with some major bombshell level statements. There is very compelling evidence that we uh, we may not be alone. Welcome to the Michigan UFO Sightings and Paranormal Encounters podcast, where we explore the unexplained and mysterious phenomena that have occurred throughout the state of Michigan and beyond. From UFO sightings to ghostly encounters, we delve deep into the stories, the evidence, and the theories behind these strange events. We are your hosts. I'm Michelle. And I'm Wayne. We are an educator duo that after an encounter with a triangular UFO in 2018 in Michigan, we decided to investigate UFOs and the paranormal. In this podcast, we will be speaking with eyewitnesses, experts, and researchers to uncover the truth about some of the most intriguing cases of paranormal activity in and around Michigan. Our goal is not to convince anyone of the existence of these phenomena, but rather to provide a platform for discussion and exploration. So, buckle up and join us on this journey down the paranormal rabbit hole. On an escalator. All right. Good evening, good morning, or good afternoon, depending on where you're at. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Michigan UFO Sightings and Paranormal Encounters podcast. I am your host, Wayne, tonight, and I'm flying solo because, well, Michelle is down for the count yet again, 
as I think the traveling and the weather changes and everything here have finally gotten to her and knocked her uh, down with a upper respiratory infection. So she's out of it. So I'm handling everything alone tonight. But welcome to the show. At the time of this recording, it is April 7th, 2024. And, uh, we're going to get things going. So first I need to say hi to everybody in chat. So what is going on? Let's see. Who do we have over here? We have Diane boss. Of course, Diane's always here. Jason Finch, Kelly Lewis. Uh, let's see. Nane is here. Welcome Nane. And anybody else in right now? Doesn't look like it. It looks like those are the main players that are always here. Uh, just welcome everybody. Yet again, we got a great guest tonight, Dr. Bruce E. Rapuano, who will be talking about his book, Dominion Lost, A Scientist's Own Alien Abduction Encounters. So we love having people on that have these experiences. And uh, our very first one was Terry Lovelace. And we love hearing these stories about abductions, the implants, the examinations, the thing that happened, we find out that, you know, these are not that uncommon. What's uncommon is people talking about their abduction uh, stories, and that's something we like to change here with our podcast. So we're going to bring our guest on here in just a minute. I just wanted to give you guys a reminder that uh, Super Chats are open. So Super Chance, the link to our PayPal, our Patreon page, all of that stuff can be found in the show description if you want to become a supporter. And when you do that, we add your name to our list of supporters in the credits at the end of the show. You can also join our little Eyes to the Sky YouTube membership just by clicking that join button. And for, uh, for a very small monthly payment, I think it's like $2.99. You get to use some very cool Michigan UFO emojis in chat, which I believe Diane has all of them. As you can see, she's posting them up there a little bit. And so does Kelly Lewis. And so let's see what else. Oh, and don't forget, if you've got a story you want to tell us, you can email us at mi.ufo.podcast at gmail.com. And we will love to hear your story and read it to the audience. So absolutely, Nain, you are welcome. Thank you for coming and spending your Sunday evening with us. All right, everybody, let's just jump into this. Uh, this story is something I want to hear. Um, I think it's going to have some tie-ins to our old friend Terry Lovelace and his abduction with him and his friend Toby. Well, he was in the Air Force, and they were abducted by that huge triangular craft, but the creatures were pretty much the same. So let's go ahead and bring on our guest, Dr. Bruce Rapuano. Am I saying that right, Dr. Bruce? Just fine, Wayne. Great. Great, well, thank, great to be with you. Great to be with you. Yeah, I truly appreciate this. Um I was very excited when you reached out and contacted me on Facebook saying that you wanted to come on and talk about your book. And when I saw a scientist, I'm like, yes, let's go. Because I am a high school science teacher. I teach earth and space science, and I would not be doing this if it wasn't for my wife and I seeing a giant 300 foot black triangle hovering above the intersection of a major road and highway we were trying to get home on and here was this gigantic craft floating there and then getting the message in my head saying you don't belong here get away you don't belong here get away and a couple months later i ended up with graves disease <laughs> so my thyroid turned on i'm losing a bunch of weight I'm losing my mind and come to find out that now I have something very rare and that is disease, hyperthyroidism. So anyways, Dr. Bruce, there's our, uh, our little background for you and uh, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much, Wayne. That's a, that's quite a story you have. And uh, uh, I think I'm, I'm 
very fortunate to be here because I, I, I know I'll have a receptive a host and audience as well that has an open mind on these, on these subjects. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're always bringing people in and wanting to talk to them and hear their, their stories and um, trying to find connections with all of this stuff and seeing if we can find out what is going on. Um, what do these beings want with us? Are they here? Uh, what kind of, technology are they using? I mean, Michigan is a hotbed for UFO activity, especially over Lake Michigan. And one of our running theories right now is, is that in the early spring with the temperature of the water, um, where it's just at that freezing and melting point, uh, we, uh, have them stealing water from the lake. Multiple witnesses have seen them drawing water up out of the lake and, uh, very interesting stuff. So um, we can circle back around and talk about that in a little bit, but I need to hit you up with this first. And I think I already know the answer, but the book title is Dominion Lost, a scientist own alien abduction encounter. Why Dominion Lost? Who's lost the Dominion and what's going on? Well, in, in beginning the process of writing this book, I thought so much about the frequency of these sightings of UFOs that I, I, I clearly felt there was a lot of evidence where a non represented a non-human technology all over the world, going back for decades. Uh, they, whoever is piloting these craft seemingly has uh, the ability to travel at will wherever they want to go, not only through our skies, but um, into, into and out of the oceans. There's a lot of evidence that, that there uh, uh, may be underwater bases for these UFOs, wherever they come from, whether they originate in a distant galaxy or perhaps have been on the earth for maybe eons. And thirdly, the, the fact that the uh, uh, occupants of the UFOs seem to be visiting us in our homes and abducting us in the thousands, tens of thousands, millions. So the, the, the idea that the, some alien civilization, maybe multiple civilizations, have the ability to travel, as I say, at will, on the land, through our skies, and underneath, through the oceans, makes me question whether or not we can consider that human beings have complete unchallenged dominion over the earth, or whether in fact we're sharing it with some non-human intelligence. That's why I entitled the book Dominion Lost. What is your sense of these creatures? What are they doing? I've heard a lot about, um, it's an alien hybrid. They are experimenting on us. Um, they, they are trying to create these hybrids so that their race or races can basically function with the humans here on earth. And then um, because their race is dying off or something along those lines. So what is your sense of how all that plays out? What do you think? Well, you know, you're touching on what the alien agenda might be and they're, probably a, a number of theories uh, circulating as to what, what that, that may be. But all I know, all we know from uh, the good work that many investigators have done in this field is that, um, you know, a hybrid race, alien human hybrid race, or what I like to call an alien human transgenic species has been created from the genetic material of normal human beings who were abducted and it appears that the, the um, species, human Homo sapiens, is being genetically modified to create, modified, I should say, to create a new species. We don't know what the, the purpose of that reproductive program is, uh, but you know, we have to be concerned that it might involve, met the hybrids and at this stage of the reproductive program 
the hybrids look exactly like us. They look no different than normal human beings. And not only that, there's a lot of evidence that uh, many of these hybrids, we don't know how many have now been. Seem to be running into a little bit we can only, of technical issues. We can only guess. I, and I would like to think the master species that <laughs> Oh, no. All right. Well, now there seems to be some, maybe we're talking about something we're not supposed to. <laughs> uh, yeah, buffering. Yeah, something's going on. All right. And he's dropped off. So once he gets back, I'll, I'll bring him on. But uh, yeah, very interesting stuff already. And um, when he gets back, I'm definitely going to be uh, having him talk about his background because you're going to want to listen to what he has to say based on his background and what he's been doing in, uh, for his life. Oh, and I see our... I can hear you. Back. There we go. <laughs> I can hear you. So if you can hear me, I'm just going to continue uh, to, to, you know, address your, you know, your, your question. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I... I, I, as I say, there are a number of hypotheses that would explain why the aliens are here, why they, one or more species has been involved in creating this this hybrid race, this alien human transgenic species. Uh, you know, I'm con concerned since they're here walking up. Um, the the motors may not be related to furthering our best interest, the human, the human uh, interest, but may involve. Um, some non-human intelligence uh, using this hybrid species to gain some influence over our civilization, perhaps at some point even uh, control so we, we lose our autonomy for, our, uh, for our, our, our daily affairs. And now there are more sanguine uh, hypotheses involving um, the idea that the aliens are trying to <laughs> evolve and that in order to evolve as a species we need to have uh, we need to be have uh, changes not only in our physiology but at the very basis of our, our our genetic endowment we need to have abilities that uh, are incorporated into our human genome so that we can perhaps interact with an alien species that uh, needs to, wants to interact with us for some reason, um, to be able to view them, communicate with them. We need to have, we need to be able to evolve and, and that process of evolution may require the, the uh, uh, addition of either modified pre-existing human genes or perhaps even the introduction of alien DNA sequences that allow us to, uh, to move to the next level to serve some unknown purpose that the aliens might have for us. I hope it's a benevolent purpose, but you know, I'm, I'm, my mind is open either way. Yeah. Um, I think those are good hypotheses and I think it, uh, it all makes sense if we think in the human way of trying to figure out what's going on, but them being alien, how do we know if it's a non-human intelligence, they might have something a different, complete vision of how the universe and everything works. So um, I guess that's what keeps us going, trying to figure out what is the agenda? Do they have an agenda? So um, all I know is why do it, why did my wife and I, <laughs> that's all I want to know. Why did we see one in 2018 hovering above a huge metropolitan area? and could hear the voice in my head telling us to get away. It, it's one of the craziest things. And uh, my wife and I were even on the Micah Hanks program telling our story and come to find out that um, uh, Christopher Mellon, who listened to our interview, contacted us and was very interested in our sighting of the triangle because he had some uh, Navy and other military personnel report to him the same kind of a thing. So um, he wanted to compare notes with us and it was very similar. So there's obviously something going on. 
Um, okay, well, why don't we do this? Uh, let's go ahead and maybe this will help our listeners get a better sense of your story. If they knew a little bit more about your background, I just jumped right in and slammed you with a question about the title of your book. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and, uh, why, 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 why should we listen to a scientist? (laughs) Well, let me, let me start by saying that uh, I have multiple degrees in neuroscience. I majored in neurobiology and minor in psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. And then I um, obtained a PhD in neuropharmacology, um, sp- spent the past several decades doing research, independent research as a cell biologist in a number of disciplines. And um, I, uh, I had been interested in the UFO phenomenon, but had a rude awakening in the 80s, when I began to uh, read what was a blossoming field of of intensive research within the wider UFO phenomenon, and that is the the study of the alien abduction uh, story. And in reading all the cases of um, the abductees and the hundreds, even thousands that had interviewed by investigators like Bud Hopkins, the late Harvard psychiatrist, Dr. John Mack, Dr. Stephen Jacobs, I was struck by how similar my my experiences that I had had uh, throughout my life were to the um, accounts that the uh, people who claimed they were abducted by aliens were relaying to the investigators that were interviewing them, to the point where I could check just about every box in that core alien abduction scenario. And... I had to come to a, which, a, a conclusion, which at the time was kind of unpalatable, that I, I could not envision any other model for understanding what had happened to me other than the UFO alien abduction model. And really didn't know, and I, at that time, and this was the mid-80s, Whitley Strieber had just published Communion in 1987. I, I didn't know if there was any way being at the start of my career as a scientist, if I could similarly report my experiences by publishing a book, by talking to um, investigators, but I decided not to do anything and uh, for fear of losing opportunities for funding and actually losing any opportunity to, to advance in my, my chosen career. But um, I, I do want to pick up on the second part of your question, which is why should we be interested in what a, uh, a scientist says um, about his own alien abduction experiences? And you know, I think it's very important um, to recognize that unfortunately, 95 to 99 percent of the scientific community does not consider this phenomenon to be real, and what I strongly believe is, and I know there are many people trained in the sciences, engineers, physicians, uh, hard scientists, bio- biologists that have had similar experiences. Um, if they come forward and report very honestly what happened to them, it, I believe, will have the effect of legitimize this type of um, scientific inquiry and bring many scientists in a variety of disciplines into our ufology community. And this is what we, what we need. It will be reports of people like myself will be seen at least by other scientists as being more credible, more plausible. And, and we need a lot more, many more members of the scientific community to be, become involved in the study of this phenomenon if we're gonna, gonna get anywhere and really trying to further our understanding of it. So I think that's how I'd like to answer that part of the question. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, speaking of your experiences, can you tell us about your first abduction experience? And did you remember it immediately after it happened or was it repressed and then surfaced later? Well, the first exp- experience, abduction experience, Wayne, that I remember 
uh, was consciously recalled. I, I've, everything I've reported in the book uh, has been a result of what I've remembered, thought about it over a number of years after it happened. I've, I've never had any regressive hypnosis. But, you know, at an age that's very common for people who claim to be abductees, um, where they have their first recalled abduction, whether they remember it consciously, whether it's been retrieved through hypnosis, seem to be at, at six years of age. At that age, I recall um, just being in my bed and maybe 7.30 in the evening, it was at dusk and I, this is in, in probably in the, in the beginning of summertime, I recall seeing a very strange looking airplane outside my bedroom window. And it looked like it was flying very close over the rooftops of the houses in our neighborhood, maybe five or six uh, streets away from our street. And it, it looked like it had a surface that was highly reflective. Even in the waning sunlight, it seemed to be reflecting a lot of light, very shiny surface, but had a fuselage that looked too round and, and too wide relative to its length. And even though I thought it was an airplane, it was the strangest looking airplane I'd ever seen. I very shortly after that, after that did something very strange. I ordinarily would have been very curious to continue to watch this strange craft outside my, my bedroom window, but was somehow induced to turn my head away and go to sleep. When I woke up, it was no longer in my bedroom. I was on a table, some type of examination table, which I... I, and I thought I was in some type of hospital. Um, so it was certainly something that I thought was a clinical environment. Since the commotion, maybe 20 feet in front of me and then sat up and saw literally dozens of beings that fit the classic gray alien uh, archetype, three and a half to four foot tall, disproportionately large hairless heads. They look white in color, but they all looked identical in appearance. And even six to a six-year-old looked as if they were copies of each other, what we call clones today. And I had a um, question in my mind, strange question, but my childish mind was wondering, were, since they all looked alike, were there boys and girls? among the group and experienced my first um, example of what I call telepathy, where that internal dialogue I was having seemed to be responded to by some voice that, that's, that informed me, or at least made me understand, yes, both sexes, male and females, were represented in this group. And at that point, I felt some intervention that I was perhaps watching too much, what I was not supposed to see, and I felt what I thought was a hand, I can't be sure, but some type of force on my chest and abdomen pushing me back down on the examination table, and that's the last part I remember of that particular experience. And, I, you know, I've seen these beings throughout my my life at, at other instances, but that's the, the first of, of what I would call um, the, the classic abduction scenario experience. Okay, so with your background in neurobiology and psychology, is there any way your experience could have been brought on by something medical or uh, some type of a traumatic of event that caused a a, a differentiation in your consciousness or something along those lines. I mean, I'm just asking it and throwing it out there because I'm sure there are people out there thinking, you know, well, some, maybe something happened to him and this was what played in his head as to what happened, or maybe a minor stroke or something along those lines that, that, changed your perception of what was going on any any chance of that well this is a very common question particularly by i would say a, a limited number of 
of scientists in the in the in the, the um, psychologist community that have attributed these abduction experiences to some type of um, childhood trauma. The only, you know, the the main um, reason why I, I I think this is a very unlikely explanation is because, you know, there are various types of childhood traumas, and hundreds, I should say, thousands to millions of of abductees have reported experiences identical to mine, with the same beings, um, going through the, in the same setting, in the same location. Um, very, very often having the same type of procedures performed on them. And it, it's, it's difficult to imagine that, that a, a, you know, a, a certain type of childhood trauma would generate this type of imagery um, that would be replicated in so many details from experiencer to experiencer to experiencer. I, I, certainly, I certainly had no... Um, experience that earthly experience that would let, lead me to believe that these experiences I had had anything to do with what had happened to me earlier in my life in terms of some type of childhood trauma. Okay. And, you know, I, 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 I think this is, um, I think this is a, a, a red herring. And in my case, and I think, um, in the investigations, even of psychologists, some psychologists that um, would be category would be be properly placed in the category of non-believer, I think there there have been psychological studies not that have shown that there is no direct relationship between um, early childhood trauma, um, some type of psychological disorder. Um, sleep paralysis, for example, some type of medical issue, and the UFO abduction experience, because there, there are so many people that for which no medical or psychological cause can be identified, and yet they still have the same uh, experience of the core alien abduction scenario that I, I and, and, and many, many other people have had. You bring up something very interesting when you talk about uh, doing the research and looking into this. What is the extent of research that you have done to investigate your own abduction um, experiences that have happened and the correlation with other people's experiences as well. How long have you been doing this and how much have you found out? You know, I, all I did before writing the book was just keep up with the UFO literature, uh, whether it was the abduction literature or, or, you know, books dealing with the wider UFO phenomenon. It was only in the past two or three years that I began to do uh, a active research because I had a, full, you know, I have a full-time, uh, uh, career as a, as a biomedical research scientist. So, the, you know, there, there was a lot of time, um, or I, I, you know, I needed to spend a lot of time to do any type of meaningful research in this area and kind of, you know, crammed it into the last two or three years while I was writing the book. And what I became very interested in uh, is the, is the issue of what the purpose of the of these implants uh, might be, and we're all familiar in this in people that follow the, the, the research in this area, the work of Dr. Roger Lear. But I was who has studied a number of abductees and actually retrieved implants um, from various parts of their body. But I was particularly interested in the experiencers like myself who recall having implants placed somewhere in the head region, um, underneath the eye in the ear, uh, inside the ear canal. And in my case, um, inside the nasal, nasal cavity. And I, I became fa fascinated the question of, with the question, what would be the purpose of an implant that would be inserted into the head of an abductee? 
Is it a tracking device? I, I thought much more likely it's something more, more than, it, although that might be one of its functions, it's, it's, it's likely that there, there's some other purpose, some other functions in addition to that. And it, it occurred to me that, you know, the aliens need to study the function of the human brain purely from scientific curiosity, perhaps, but also with, with the, the goal of perhaps need, uh, mapping the human brain and the, the substrates of human mental activity for the purpose of trying to better our, spe our species, to allow us to evolve, to be able to, to um, communicate with other intelligent species, or another hypothesis is that they're trying to exert some learn what they need to learn, learn how our brain brains work so they can control us by controlling our brains, involving implants that can not only detect brain waves and read the human mind, but actually beam different forms of energy into the brain to deceive us, modify our behavior, and control the entire species by controlling the brains of the of of the members of of, of our of our species. And I, um, that's why I, I, I studied a lot of um, uh, papers that, that dealt with, you know, what human scientists are doing in this area, particularly Elon Musk, Neuralink um, company that's, that's trying to develop implants to modify brain activity with people that are um, um, disabled, paraplegics, and so forth. And building out that research, I tried to uh, imagine how an alien species might further develop that technology for the purposes I just mentioned. Has anybody else? Uh, I have no experience. I've, I've, of course, I, I don't have any direct evidence. My mother or father were, and I, the only. Evidence, which I think is very compelling, and I deal with it at length in the book, is that my my grandfather uh, had a um, a blood clot in an area of the brain, which is very close to the likely area that would be an approach, surgical approach, for introducing an implant, an alien implant, and because it's a surgical approach that's used by um, human surgeons to uh, remove uh, tumors from the pituitary gland. And it's just, it was, it was very surprising to me that my grandfather had a blood clot that developed into a meningitis in a, um, um, a sinus cavity that is so rare that it, it probably only happened in five or six other cases in the year that he died, which was 1932, and what I what I uh, discuss in the book is the is the likelihood that since this phenomenon has been discussed as a multi generational phenomenon, that it's actually much more likely that rather than having um, uh, an uncomplicated clot in a sinus cavity cavity that took his life, it's even actually more likely that my grandfather was the victim of some type of experimental procedure involving insertion of an implant into one of his nasal cavities. And if that is the case, then it was, it's, 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 it would be certain that it would be not a human uh, experiment, but a, some type of alien um, uh, experimental program that I speculate took my grandfather's life. So that's a long, long answer to, to your question, whether I think there were other members of my family that were involved in this particular, have been involved in, in the abduction program. And so I would have to answer yes to that. Now, you know, I don't know about the other generations, but, I, but certainly I think my grandfather probably was involved. Do you find, do you find a young age 
and then eventually went into neuro, you know, neurobiology and became a research scientist for exactly what you're thinking that they might be interested in our brains for. I find that very peculiar and I don't believe in coincidences that you are in that field. You, you have a minor in psychology as I do. I'm an earth and space scientist and a teacher. You are a neurobiologist and a research scientist. And yet you've had these abductions and you're right where you seem to need to be. I find this odd. Well, the best way to answer that question, I think, is to is to tell you that what I believe is the bridge between this early child childhood abduction experience, the age of two or three or, or six years old, and my wanting to to study neuroscience as a career is what happened to me very early, very soon after I had an abduction experience, gosh, at the age of 11, 12, probably 12 or 13. Within, a, within months of that particular experience, I became fascinated with the uh, study of ESP. And I would actually talk about it in class. One of my teachers asked me to give a lecture on it. I, I talked about it so much. And as you know, many, many of abductees have, have claimed that after going through these experiences, they, they, they seem to have these paranormal abilities that, that, that they have that they weren't aware that they had before. Um, they seem to, it may, whether it's precognition or whether it's telepathy with, with uh, the, that, that they're able to experience, not just with the aliens, but with close friends and, and relatives. And it, you know, I really think that if that's the case, that if part of the, of the alien agenda is to get human beings to develop these extrasensory abilities for whatever purpose, and, you know, that, that experience I had at the age of 13 may, may be an indication of why I became so fa fascinated with the brain, its functions, and, you know, functions that go beyond normal, the normal five senses that may have something to do with a higher order cognitive functions. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's the, the likeliest reason uh, why my interest in neuroscience is connected to my abduction experience, experiences. To put it like <laughs> since the beginning. I've been what? Say that again? You, you've been set up since the beginning when this all started. Like you were put on this path, I think. And, it, and My, I just, yeah. I, I find it like, like I would never do a podcast in my life. I never thought about doing or talking about UFOs or paranormal or anything. I really didn't have much of an interest in it outside of pop culture until 2018. And now here we are. I'm an educator. I went into the earth and space sciences, psychology, and now I'm doing this with my wife. She's got a master's degree in ELA and has been teaching for 23 years. We have nothing to gain out of this, yet here we are. And I keep on meeting people such as yourself, and we, we talk, and it seems like that people are being picked years ago to get us to this point right now that you are thinking of the bridge that connects what their agenda is with the human brain. I think more on an education level of the earth and space sciences and what this means from a human, you know, the human standpoint and how to, how to get people to talk about it and deal with their experiences and getting it out there and let them know, Hey, you're not alone in these things. And it, it just, it just, and that's why I asked you about your research. It just seems to go on and on and on. 
with these coincidences of non coincidences. And it just seems set up to me. Your thoughts? Well, working working in the in the the field of cell biology for for decades, I never imagined that I would have any interest in doing research in alien neural implants or brain machine interfaces. You know, where you know, you're talking about areas of research that bridge that bridge electrical engineering, material science, um, neurology, among among others, and I, I don't know why I ended up doing this. My wife has has a theory that, you know, I was abducted for the purpose of writing this book. Ding ding that ding! Your wife. That, that 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 was that was why I spent the past 30, 40 years, of course, after having experiences, but but being in the in in the um, field of medical research, uh, was because. After I was done with that, or at the at the at the end of, of that career, my my task I was tasked to write this book, and she may she may have hit the nail on the head. Yeah, I think uh, as I used to say back in the seventies or eighties with those game shows, circle gets a square. I think she she wins that one. <laughs> right, um, right. So the book, once again, everybody, the book is called. And this is for our audio listeners as well. It's called Dominion Lost, a Scientist's Own Alien Abduction Encounters. In the chat, you're going to see the link pop up right there to Amazon where you can pick up the book. There's also another version of the book. Am I correct in that? There's like an abridged version. You want to tell us a little bit about the differences in the, the two copies of the books? Yeah, the the um, the full unabridged version is 450 pages. It contains a lot of scientific analysis. Um, I, I, it was analysis I felt I had to do that no one else um, in the ufology community had 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 done it. They hadn't addressed those those uh, those topics. But I know um, that. The, the best way to communicate to an to a readership what my experiences were having a UFO close encounter with multiple witnesses and having a number of instances of of being abducted by aliens the best way to communicate communicate those experiences um, is to is to just have a shorter book that just in in and sometimes, painful detail tells everything that happened to me without so much of the analysis. And I think a lot of people would be interested in reading that abridged version. And that may also provoke their curiosity to, to read about how I, how as a scientist, I analyze my own experience. And that may, that may of course prompt them to be curious about reading the, the second book as well. But I, you know, I, I, I think that, um, I, you know, I want to have a, a, a book that people that have an interest in science can read and, you know, and have a good, a good experience. And people who don't have such a strong interest in science, but have an interest in this particular area of, of inquiry, um, UFO alien abduction, to have a, you know, a, you know, a satisfactory reading experience. So I need, I think I needed to have two versions of the book. Yeah, very, uh, very good. Um, any chance that these are going to be audio books at some point? Yes. Yes. I, I have to say it's more likely that the, you know, it's to be honest, Wayne, it's, it's difficult to have an audio book talk about without the diagrams and the charts I have so much of the scientific analysis. I think it's more likely it's, it's going to be the, the audiobook will be available for the abridged version that just deals almost exclusively with my abduction experiences. You know, so the answer um, will be yes. I, I have uh, these talks with some of my scientist friends, and and I see what goes on in the 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 culture and and on TV with you know Neil deGrasse Tyson and and all of this, and they 
they poo poo aliens and ETs and these visitations because, you know, it's not science. It's not science. And my argument right. always is that when you're, you're taking uh, the enlightenment steps of the scientific method and you're trying to apply that to something that we cannot have a repeatable experiment and we cannot, you know, do this stuff. We need to change the way that we're doing science when it comes to UFOs, UAPs, and even the paranormal, you know, what we need to start thinking outside the box a little bit about how we can figure this out. And so far, nobody's had any kind of an answer for me as to uh, some ideas and different tacks we could take. Uh, do we need different technology? Do you know, something's got to change with us and the scientific method, quote unquote. And I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. If you've had any, uh, you know, shower moments where you're sitting there and you go, you know, we should research things this way instead of that way. You know, when you get those best ideas that hit you in the shower. So what's your thoughts? Very, I'm very fundamental. You know, I, I deal in the book a lot with, uh, all of the all of the scientific analysis we could do on implants, um, all of the biological analysis we could do on, you know, if we had other um, bodies like the, the the aliens that that died in the at the crash in, in the crash at Roswell, that were apparently, according to Lieutenant uh, Colonel Philip Corso, uh, examined by pathologists at Walter Reed Hospital, and they. they and he, you know, there's an extensive amount of a postmortem analysis that was done. And I, I, I discuss it in the book, but, you know, in addition, you know, there are perhaps alien human hybrids that could be studied if, if for some, some, some reason we, uh, you know, those subject, th those particular um, individuals could be involved in, in, uh, it could be subjects of experimentation, but I, I think what we need is to have enough scientists, uh, enough, enough highly qualified scientists working together in a number of disciplines where they can share information, discipline, you know, with discipline. So it's, it's, we don't have the type of research that that's done in the military, which is so highly compartmentalized. And I, I you know, I think, there's a lot that we can learn in terms of what is b being done to the human genome uh, by this non-human intelligence that's been experiment experimenting on, on us uh, that we can learn with, with existing human technology. Um, and I, I think in terms of how the, 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 um, the UFOs operate, I think we need to have Theoretical, theoretical physicists brought on board, and and um, become involved in 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 the, in the study in a very broad basis, where you know we're not relying on military research, where you know they're they're selecting people um, who may not be the most qualified people to to study. A, an advanced technology. So I think that that has to change. And I don't know politically how that can change, but that one of my dreams is that that, that um, um, you know, you know, I, I think that traditional research, there's, there's opportunity for traditional scientific research um, to gain a lot of information that could be helpful to us in understanding every aspect of this phenomenon. Do you think if we get rid of this, <laughs> get a lot more of these mainstream scientists show up and be interested in looking at this phenomenon, you know, legitimately? That I, you know, that's my, that's my bias. I, I really feel that more scientists that come forward and say that we've had these experiences 
this is our take on it. We've this is the analysis we've we've made based on the fact that we've you know, we've we're um, we do observation and have hypothesis testing, hypothesis generation and testing for our our career, for our our, our livelihood. And this is this is our, our take on on what we've experienced. It will legitimize further study of the phenomenon by mainstream scientists. And mm-hmm. this is what I'm hoping, especially if many more people like myself come forward and write books and or. Re- or report their, you know, accounts of, of abduction experiences. Um, I think it's going to wake up the rest of the of the scientific scientific community. At least get them to look in our direction. And once they look in our direction, they're going to find a lot that um, could be the subject of scientific study. You know, um, they asked Einstein about what it, about his opinion regarding the UFO phenomenon, and he said. You know, I, I know people are seeing something. I believe that they, they're they seeing something they can't explain. I don't know what they're seeing, and I'm not the least been interested in it. But what scientists <laughs> need, <laughs> they need to, but they need to have something in the form of scientific data before they become interested. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Nain oh, in the chat hey. asked, have yeah. you ever been visited by the men in black or has anyone from the U.S. military come forward to you? Well, I'm actually one of them. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. I'm wearing a black shirt. <laughs> no, that's never happened, Wayne. Um, I've, I've thought about it and uh, that's never happened before I wrote the book or after I wrote the book. Although... You know, it's remarkable. I have, um, I won't say scientists, but professional people that I've been in contact with that had similar experiences to mine that, that I've met since I've wrote, written this book. And they, they do have some strange experiences with, uh, that lead them to believe that they are being watched by somebody, by some agency, whether it's human or non-human agency. I, I, I'm not, I, I don't know. But I, I, I have no evidence this happened to me yet. Let's uh, talk about the implant for a minute. What have you discovered about the implant in people that, you know, like Terry Lovelace, for instance, is somebody, he's got x-rays of a couple of implants in his body that literally look like there are wires that are coming off into his skin and they don't want to remove them because they don't know what it may do to him. And now this guy's been a lawyer for the United States over, I think he was the, the head United States lawyer over in Tonga, I believe, or uh, the Solomon Islands, something along those lines. I don't remember. It's been a long time. And you know, his abduction case and he was taken off by the OSI in severely like interrogated to no end to the point where him and his best buddy that were taken and had these implants, I believe his, his uh, one friend ended up dying. And I think it was uh self-induced. Uh, he was driven so far off the edge by the questions and what happened. He was, he was traumatized by what happened between him and Terry uh, it uh devil's done so i'm curious as to what you think these implants may be and how many of these kind of stories have you come across well as i briefly alluded to earlier my theory is that these devices especially the ones that are uh, implanted in the head region are brain machine interfaces that able to communicate with um, a remote alien AI that can receive inst- um, information in the form of brain waves that are relayed from these implants, either in the sinus cavity or maybe in intra- plant and intra- 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 brain that allow them to read human thoughts, uh, map human mental activity, and which gives the aliens the capacity, I believe, to not only influence human thinking and human behavior, but the, in theory, play the, play the human mind like a piano. 
there's been so many uh, reports where on board a UFO, immediately after having an implant inserted into the nasal cavity, the aliens undergo some type of scan, some type of procedure. One investigator calls it a mind scan where the, the sees images, and, uh, hears sounds, smells, and there's some type of, feels that uh, his mind or her mind is being probed by some alien intelligence. And so I think that these, these implants are at the heart of a program of I think we lost Dr. Rappo now. Once again. Maybe it's the solar eclipse stuff going on. <laughs> or or the men in black are actually now paying attention. <laughs> well, the internet is a funny thing. I don't know where he is uh living at or connecting to us from maybe the internet is bad in that area yeah he just dropped off so he'll he'll be back on in a moment so what do you guys think so far of the the conversation i mean i am finding this uh fascinating that we see somebody with these credentials i mean a neurobiologist for god's sakes you know somebody who's been doing this for the majority of his life as a research scientist is coming forward with this. I just, I find it uh, extremely fascinating. So chat, what are, what are your thoughts right now? I can, uh, you're loving his story. Yeah. I definitely want to pick up his book for sure. Yeah. You know, my next set of questions, I want to get into uh, some of the alien technology uh, about the, the ships. It makes me think and type a lot of questions. Nane, you're always typing a lot of questions. I think I should just like send you the bio of our guests, let you read it, and then you can send me all the questions to ask. <laughs> so, yeah. Let's see. Uh, Jay Hall says, actually, conversations like this can put one over the edge. We must be careful. Seriously. That is true. That is true. And that is one of the reasons why we have our Facebook group. And you guys can look up our Facebook group and go ahead and join. Um, I want people to be able to share their experiences in a, I, I don't want to sound cliche, but you know, in a safe space, right. To be able to share those experiences and, and if anything, just get them out there and let other people know, Hey, you're not alone. I think metalhead you're, you were saying that you think you were, uh, abducted at one point and you witnessed a triangle above your head and in a blink of an eye, four and a half hours passed. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Something went down for sure. And it looks like uh, Janine Hollis has joined us checking in from the West side of Detroit, West side. What's going on? Good seeing you, Janine, as always. Thanks for joining us. Does missing time after a UFO visitation mean abduction? It could. I mean, I don't know what else it would mean. You know, why would they take four and a half hours of your time? It's uh, it's strange, but uh, waiting to see if the doctor returns here. Oh, there he is. Okay, and he's joined us, so let's bring him back on. Uh, All right, welcome back. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And I think the I men guess, in black have found you. Yes, I think so. <laughs> um, the, I'll just finish the, the last part of my, my answer to your question by saying that I'm hoping that what the aliens are doing with those implants are trying to make us uh, be all that we can be. 
and evolve and be better so that we can join the community, the galactic community of, of advanced civilizations. That's my hope. I'm, I, you know, I, I, I think I'm an optimist by nature, but I have to be open-minded to both possibilities. Sure. Yep. Um, before we uh, end this, we've got probably about 20 minutes left or so. Can we dig into what your thoughts are about the technology that these ships are using and how they're able to do what they do? I know you say in your book you have a a good knowledge or it says precisely how the UFO propulsion systems create gravitational wave energy. So I'm curious as to what your thoughts are on that and how are they doing this? Cause they are doing right angle turns at G forces that would just turn a human into a pancake. And we've got all kinds of credible reports from Naval fighter pilots and things like David Fravor and Ryan Graves. And they seem to be coming forward more and more with their stories of what they run into. So I'm curious as to what your ideas are about the technology and the propulsion systems. Well, my ideas, I have to say, were, were uh, inspired by Bob Lazar's story. And in, in the Dreamland, he talks about you know, he, he, he's, he was a senior physicist at Area 51, was one of the scientists trying to reverse engineer uh, one of nine alien UFOs that was in the possession of, of the U.S. military. And he, he makes a, a convincing argument that the, uh, the alien uh, vessel was powered by an antimatter reactor that somehow generated gravitational energy. But what I thought, well, and he mentions, of course, he talks a lot about this um, um, element 115, that at the time, you know, he first broke the story with, with, uh, with George Knapp, didn't exist. And, you, and I guess 10 or 15 years later, scientists discovered this alien 115. And in a nutshell, without getting too much into the weeds, I think if he's right, it, this gravity drive that the aliens have requires an antimatter, antimatter reactor in, uh, in which the element 115 is a source of positrons. And the antimatter reactor, antimatter reactor may also be a collider that then can collide positrons, which is the antimatter version of the electron, with electrons to create um, gravitational Wave, en wave energy. Um, and uh, that is basically my theory of how that antimatter, that, that gravity drive, which is based on an antimatter reactor that Bob Lazar talked about, might work to generate enough gravitational energy to, to bend warp space time so that the, uh, the UFO can travel instantaneously from one point in space to another by compressing the space between those two points. But again, that's just a, a theory. And um, uh, I, I think that based on Lazar's story, I, I think human science needs, needs to, to uh, go a long, long way to be able to completely reverse engineer such, such a, a, a fantastically uh, advanced um, propulsion system. Yeah, um, I'm looking at in chat right now, they're talking about uh, Nain was saying that according to the federal government, he wasn't there at Area 51. <laughs> and then we just kind of laugh because, well, I don't think many people around here trust the federal government, especially after the latest Arrow report. And in that report, it talks about the uh, there being no evidence of reverse engineering programs or anything like that being done by the USG. Do you think, or have you had any experiences when you were abducted? Have you been told or any, any indication during those experiences that we do have, have they said to you, we have some of the material and we are working on it. I never had any 
information imparted to me telepathically, never had any, after my abduction experiences, never had any mental downloads and any scientific information in this area. I wish that I had. I would have passed it along to, you know, the uh, physicists in the field that uh, of, of, of uh, you know, of gravitational physics uh, to, you know, perhaps let them work on it. But uh, no, I, I, I can't say that I have. Okay. All right. Let's see. What else did I want to ask you? Did you read the Arrow report and what are your thoughts on it? Well, I thought it was um, interesting that the report that was put out a year before that, um, you know, that talked about the characteristics, the, um, the flight, the performance characteristic was the word they used, was the term they used to describe the, U, the UFOs and the, and the UAPs, that they were unconventional performance characteristics that could not be attributed to any human experimental programs. Mm-hmm. And now a year later, they're saying, well, you know, whatever, whatever you see up there, if it looks so much more advanced than, than, than what we think any, you know, mo- modern aircraft uh, could, you know, could, could, uh, you know, has technology that's much more advanced than, than any modern aircraft, any of our modern aircraft, that it's, it's something that you, the, the human, that, uh, you know, uh, American uh, uh, scientists have been working on for the past 20 or 30 years. So it seems that their, the position has changed dramatically in, in, in just a year. You know, what was, you know, a, a non-human, unconventional performance characteristics a year ago is not some, now something that was, you know, um, stuff that we were working on all along. So I'm obviously skeptical at the discrepancy between the, those two reports. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, just so uh, everybody knows who's listening later on in an audio uh, format here, I have been running a poll on in the chat room, and I asked the question, have you had an abduction experience with what you believe to be extraterrestrial? 17% of the people that answered the poll say yes. Are you and asking me that? Excuse me? Bruce? I think we lost him again. But 83% said no. So 17% of the people in chat said that they do believe that they have been abducted. And 83% say no. Very interesting. I, I I've lost you there for oh, for a moment. There we go. You're back now. Okay. <laughs> you are being jammed, sir. <laughs> I'm getting to believe that. Yes. Yeah. Don't be surprised if there's a knock on your door and and uh, there's some strange no, looking I, dudes in suits. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Were you were you asking me a question before? No, I had put a question in chat as a poll and I asked them if, you know, any experience with ETs, do you think you were abducted? And it was 17% said yes. Okay. And, uh, was it 63, 73% said no. All right. So, yeah. So, um, but these are people that have all pretty much everybody that we have in our chat room during these live shows have had some kind of experience. And uh, so we kind of are the Island of misfit toys when it comes to. Yeah. That's uh, a, that's a little high. I I remember the, uh, the Roper poll that um, John Mack and Stephen Jacobs, uh, you know, uh, participated in where I think they, their conclusion was based on um, the people they surveyed. I think there were 6,000 people that were surveyed perhaps one to 5% of the American population has had the abduction experience, which is, yeah. I mean, they were talking about millions of people. Yeah. I'm looking at the results right here and it's uh, uh, 83% of the people said no. While 16% of the people said yes, that they, 
they do attribute their experience to also being abducted, which wow. is okay. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, one of one of our uh, Nain once again. Let me bring this up. Um, let me find his because this sent me on a rant in our Facebook group. We have a Facebook group of about seventy two hundred people now that have related their stories and send us videos and pictures of things. And some of the things, you know, you can't tell it could be a smudge on a glass. It could be a reflection in glass, you know, those kind of things. But other ones are like, Whoa, very, very bizarre. Um, even to the point where we've had the director of MUFON from Michigan here on our show and showed him, you know, and he's like, uh, send me that. That looks really good. So, Nain asks, um, or he says, I like how these giant quote unquote triangle ships just hover in the sky. What man-made tech used today hovers and hovers silently. And I'm going to add to that Nain, uh, and then disappears basically in a blink of an eye and shoots out of, you know, vision in no time at all. I mean, that's, you know, I, I get on these people and I just basically call them disinfo agents that are in our group and they, their answer for everything is it's military yet. They've never seen it themselves. And I'm sorry, but I've been around pilots my whole life. My dad is a retired pilot. He fought in Vietnam and flew helicopters in Vietnam. And these guys talk if they're doing the latest technology and flying around, they talk about it. There's no way you can keep people quiet when they're playing around with this stuff and not talk, get them a beer or two. And, and they're, they're telling you stories, all kinds of stories. And I just do not believe that it is our military and human made technology. And I guess that's kind of why I wanted to have your opinion on the reverse engineering and these craft that people are seeing. Could they be ours that are reversed engineered? Well, remember, uh, I think everyone in, in, in this field, uh, I think remembers the incident at the, at the Edward Edwards air force base in, in 65, where, uh, you know, after the intrusion, the same type of um, capabilities, technical capabilities, performance characteristics was observed by uh, the uh, pilots of the fighter aircraft, the uh, uh, control, per the personnel in the, in the control tower. And they remarked on how the uh, craft could, in one or two seconds, um, increase altitude from 5,000 feet to 80,000 or 100,000 feet. In fact, one I think the tower op operator had mentioned that in the space of one to two seconds, one of these UFOs could be seen to traverse 20 to 30 miles, almost moved from point A to point B instantaneously. And it's it's very, very difficult for me to believe that and even if we, we had even if we had people at Lockheed Skunk Works and uh, and other um, uh, air, you know areas at Area 51 trying to reverse reverse engineer the UFOs that they that they were able to produce that technology technology human technology 60 years ago I, I find that almost impossible to believe now what we have meaning humans, human beings have flying around now, 60 years later, could be much more advanced than, than, you know, anyone is aware of, but not, you know, six or seven decades ago. I, 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 I find it almost impossible to believe that. That was that that would be of human origin. Right. Now I can understand like people seeing the B2 stealth bomber and the F-117, you know, uh, stealth fighter i could see them seeing that and thinking holy crap it's a flying triangle but it's not stopping in midair it's not doing right angle turns and it's not doing 
you know, 3000 miles per hour. It's still following the laws of aerodynamics. I mean, it, it's just, it's just beyond me. And that's why I end up calling these people like disinformation <laughs> agents. It's like, you must not have seen one because if you saw one, I mean, I, I cannot explain to you the, the, the sight of seeing a black triangle with a skin on it. That is, well, it's about 300 feet on a side and it's probably about 20 to 30 feet tall with three ex uh, lights in the corners that are so bright. You can't look at them, but yet, even though it's close to the ground, you don't see a spotlight on the ground and it's black outside cause it's two 30 in the morning. So it's not, the light is being controlled. It's not reaching the ground, even though the photons are reaching your eyes. It's like, you can see the light, you can't look at it, but it's not hitting the ground. It, it's one of the most bizarre things. And, and just to see it hovering there and then looking up at it and seeing the, the skin of the craft. And it looks like a heat mirage in the middle of July on blacktop. It's just wavering. It's doing this weird wavering stuff and it's, uh, it, it, and to, it, to have people say, oh, it's our military. Okay. Well then somebody is breaking the law by breaking every FAA regulation of flying an experimental craft, which may or may not be dangerous to people based on its propulsion system over a massive populated area. It just, it makes no sense to me. Military guys would not endanger, you know, fellow civilians on the ground. So I just keep adding those up and it's like, and I know we have counterintelligence people in our, in our group as well. They, they ask questions and come in with stories and they want to see what we know. It, it's very apparent that they are doing that. And if you know how some of these agencies work, it's, you know, it's pretty easy to pick them out. So I, that's why I like asking you the question about the, uh, have you been contacted or, or anything like that with military or noticed anything strange, not to make you paranoid or anything, but. <laughs> no, no. I mean, if, if anything I've had, I've been contacted by high level scientists with the important government agency that claim to have experiences that were in many ways similar to my abduction experiences. And I'm not, not going to name the agency, but, but um, you know, it was clearly someone trying to, you know, to get a handle on what happened to him. And, and I think, you know, might've been helped to some degree by, by reading my book. But in terms of the other type of individual, I, I you know, I, I don't look forward to, to that type of interaction. Yeah, I, I don't blame you. All right, everybody. Um, just so you guys are aware, the link to uh, the book is in the chat room. And the book, once again, is Dominion Lost, A Scientist's Own Alien Abduction Encounters. Um so, Bruce, do you have any other speaking engagements coming up? Have you been invited to, like, contact in the desert or any big conventions like that to speak on this? Because I think you'd be one of the most perfect people to be able to go to these conferences and give your talk and uh, or give a talk about your experiences. Well, and, I've been uh, looking. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I've been looking into the contact in, uh, in the desert, and uh, uh, there was one or two that, you know, I, I might have been involved in. I think one has been canceled, and but I, you know, I'm certainly, certainly um, um, would be very interested and excited to participate in, in that type of an event. You know, these these events are often difficult to put together, and uh, you know, um, but when when they happen, they could be, and they when they do happen, they can be very informative. And we we've never needed, you know, you know, um, these type of um, uh, um, 
get togethers where we have people exchanging so much useful information that, yeah. that hopefully yeah. can get the, the, the attention of the scientific community. And yeah. you can yeah. pass along any information you have to me uh, regarding any, any, any interest that, that, that some of your contacts, you know, might have in, in, um, in uh, getting me to participate. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. These type of things. Think up, you can always uh, share it with me. You know, we, we're connected through Facebook and stuff and I can, uh, you know, advertise it on our, our weekly show, you know, and you. I know the, I know people are really going to, love hearing what you have to say on our audio side. Once I release this to the, the audio networks and uh, they're, they're really going to enjoy and, and like what you have to say. So, and, and especially coming with the legitimacy and stuff that you do as a scientist, I think that make, that's going to make all the difference in the world and let's get this figured out and see what's going on at least the best that we can. So I All right. Appreciate it. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. So everybody, one more time, that is Dominion Lost, a scientist's own alien abduction encounters. Get over there on Amazon, hit that link, go pick it up. There's two versions of the book. There's an abridged version and then the full 400 plus page version. Uh, pick the one that you want and uh, check it out. So thank you. Once again, and that is Dr. Bruce. And let me see if I remember how to pronounce your last name again. Rapuano. Yeah. You got it. Yes. All right. Thanks so much for having me, Wayne. Yes, was, you are very welcome. Great to meet you. Great to meet you. Okay. And thank you. And you can contact me at any time on Facebook, in other words. In, in, okay. in, other, in, in other words. Sounds great. Well, have a good night. All right. You too. Take care, Wayne. Take care. Ooh, all right, everybody. Was that an incredible interview about experiences or what? That is amazing. And here we have literally a mainstream research scientist who is looking into these things and has his own experiences. And it just, it's more evidence right? It's more evidence that we are putting into the pot that shows that these things are happening. People are not crazy. Uh, well, maybe some of them are, and I guess we're all a little bit crazy, but it, it's not us people. It's not us. I, I, I don't know how much more to say it. Maybe a little tiny sliver of it might be us, but it's, I cannot believe that People say everything is our military and I was in the military. We talk and, and we do not keep things quiet. I'm sorry. Uh, it eventually comes out and, and usually it's sitting up at a bar, right? So, all right, everybody in chat want to say thank you very much for joining us. Guy Merritt, I see you joined us a little bit late. You were on an important phone call. Well, that's okay because you can rewatch the show and, Listen to what he has to say. I think you're going to be very much in agreement with what uh, Dr. Bruce had to say. So, all right, everybody, I'm going to get out of here. Remember, you can support the show by join, hitting that join button. You can hit our Patreon, hit our PayPal, buy us a coffee. All the links are in the show notes, all of that good stuff. But be ready for... <laughs> For the solar eclipse tomorrow, and it's Diane's birthday tomorrow. Diane, happy birthday. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Straw Dog. Uh, it's a great show because you guys are here. So, and Nain has some of the best questions on the internet. So, but yeah, April 8th is Diane Boss's birthday. And it's going to be a pretty much a total solar, total solar eclipse. So, all right, everybody, Michelle's back in the back there recovering. She's crashed out on her sinus meds. And so here's knocking on wood that I don't get it yet again. All right, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Love having you guys here. And remember, as always, 
Keep those eyes to what? Keep those eyes to that sky. Have a great night, everyone.